Imagine we have two points, P and Q, in the 2D space. Measuring the distance between them is simple. We can just use the Euclidean distance. But what if P and Q are probability distributions? How do we measure how similar they are? In this video, we will explore the fascinating concept of Koba liber divergence, or KRO divergence. KRO divergence applies to both discrete and continuous distributions, and it shows up everywhere in machine learning. We use it to distill the knowledge from large models into smaller ones. Train generated models that approximate the data distributions. And prevent language models from drifting too far during alignment. We will start with an intuitive explanation of what carrier divergence really means, and then walk through a simple and efficient way to compute it. When we check tomorrow's weather, we might see a 50% chance of a sunny or rainy day. This is the probability distribution P that reflects our confidence in different outcomes. Now suppose it says the probability of a sunny day is close to 90%. If it turns out sunny, well, that's expected. But if it rains, you probably find it surprising, right? That's the idea. The less likely an event, the more surprising it is. In other words, surprise is inversely proportional to probability. If it rains all week after a week-long sunny forecast, it's now 5 times as surprising. To capture this, we define surprise as log 1 over p of x. Why log? Because the probability of independent events multiplies, but logs turn products into sums, making surprise additive. This is known as surprise or self-information, measuring how much information or surprise a single outcome carries. But what's the average surprise from this distribution? We compute the expected value of surprise weighted by the probabilities. We call this entropy, a measure of distribution's overall uncertainty. When using base 2 logs, we have the unit of information in bits. For example, when all outcomes are equally likely, the entropy is 1 bit. It means that we need one yes-no question to figure out the outcome. If a rainy day is guaranteed with a probability of 1, the entropy is 0 bit. No uncertainty, no surprise. Let's write the equation of entropy more compactly. Here xi denotes possible outcomes. Let's extend the example by adding a cloudy day. Suppose the forecast says 50% sunny, 25% cloudy, and 25% a rainy day. Now the entropy is the sum of three terms. It's 1.5 bits of information. What does that mean? It means that we can encode the outcome with an average of 1.5 bits. We label the event as ones and zeros to describe the outcomes. As the sunny day is more probable, we assign it to a shorter code. We assign one zero and one one as the code for the other two outcomes. So on average, the code length is 1.5 bits. But what if we use the code optimized for another distribution? In this case, on average, we need 1.75 bits of information. This is called cross entropy. The average code length is now longer because we trust the wrong model. The carrier divergence is simply the extra bits we waste. It measures the extra cost of using the wrong distribution Q to encode the data, when the data actually follows a true distribution P. A quick recap. Self-information quantifies the surprise of a particular outcome. Rare events are more surprising and carry more information. The entropy measures the average surprise, that is, the expected number of bits needed to encode outcomes using an optimal code. The cross entropy is the average surprise when using a wrong distribution Q instead of P. The KRO divergence quantifies how much extra surprise or inefficiency we incurred by using the wrong distribution Q. This tells us how far off the distribution Q is from P. But KRO divergence is not really a distance. Depending on the order, we have either forward KRO or reverse KRO. Generally, the two values are different. Let's understand the symmetry with a simple analogy. Imagine we want to compare the high difference between two brothers, Oliver and Oscar. It's not that informative to say their high difference is 10cm. 
we need to choose a reference for this comparison. Like Oliver is 10 cm taller than Oscar. Or Oscar is 10 cm shorter than Oliver. We often refer P as the reference true distribution and Q as our model approximate distribution. Minimizing the forward and reverse scale results in different behaviors. Assume our true distribution P has two peaks. Here we try to approximate it using a simple Gaussian distribution Q. Forward Carroll punishes when distribution Q misses where P has mass. So Q spreads out to cover all modes. This results in mode covering behavior. Reverse Carroll, on the other hand, punishes Q for assigning mass where P has none. This leads to mode seeking. That is, the distribution Q picks one peak and ignores the rest. Carroll divergence appears everywhere in machine learning. In classification, we train models to predict a probability distributions over classes. We encode a true label as a one-hot distribution P, and the model predicts Q. With the two distributions, we use the Carroll divergence from P to Q as our loss. But if we look closely, this term is just a constant and does not depend on our model parameters. So in this case, minimizing the Carroll divergence is the equivalent to minimizing cross-entropy loss which is what you see in most training code. But there's a problem. In many applications, computing care divergence exactly is expensive. For discrete distributions, we need to sum over all possible outcomes. In language model, these outcomes are tokens, and modern models can have vocabularies with over 200,000 tokens. For continuous distributions, it's even worse. Unless we are dealing with something simple like Gaussians, there's no closed-form solution for the Carroll divergence. In short, exact computation is often infeasible. So we need a way to efficiently estimate the Carroll divergence. Let's start by rewriting Carroll divergence as an expectation of the log ratio between P and Q. To estimate this expectation, we can use a simple but powerful technique called Monte Carlo estimation. Instead of computing the expectation directly, we draw samples from the probability distribution P of x. For each sample xi, we compute the values of log P of xi and log Q of xi. We then add them up together and divide the sum by the number of samples. This gives us a Monte Carlo approximation of the Carroll divergence. Let's write this more concisely. This estimator is unbiased, meaning that as the number of samples increases, the approximation converges to the true KL values. This follows from the law of large numbers. Let's try it out. Say we want to compute the forward KL divergence from distribution P to Q, where both are Gaussian distributions. Here we pick Gaussians so we can compute the true KL analytically. So how do we approximate it with Monte Carlo estimation? We draw samples from the distribution P of X as yellow dots. Now for each sample xi, we can compute the value of log p of xi and log q of xi. We then average this to get our estimate. Here we plot the results with different sample sizes n. For each n, we repeat the experiment 10 times and see how well it approximates the true Carroll value of 0.02. The good news, with enough samples, our estimator approaches the true value. The bad news? There's a lot of variations from one trial to another. This estimator has high variance. Even worse, some estimated values are negative, which shouldn't happen because Carroll divergence is always non-negative. So how do we reduce the variance? The problem lies in the log ratio term. Log P over Q is negative whenever Q of X is larger than P of X. Let's try a variance reduction trick. We square the log ratio term to ensure the estimator is always non-negative. And it works. This square estimator gives us a much lower variance and reasonably accurate values, at least when P and Q are close. But it's not always this simple. Let's test the same estimator when P and Q are further apart. Here the true Carroll divergence is 0.5. Oh no, this looks bad. Even with lots of samples, our estimates do not converge to the true value. 
This deviation from the true expectation is called bias. Here our estimator consistently overestimate the true value. Now we face a dilemma. On the one hand, the simple estimator is unbiased but has high variance. On the other hand, the square estimator has lower variance but is biased. Can we have the best of both words? We start with this simple unbiased estimator. The idea is to add a correction term with zero expected value. This technique is known as control variance. We define the function r as q of x divided by p of x. With this choice, we can show that the expectation of r of x under the distribution p is just 1. But now how do we pick the value of lambda? Let's simplify the equation a bit using the function r of x. To understand this visually, let's look at two curves. Here is the curve of log r, and here is the line of r minus 1. We see that the r minus 1 is the tangent line to the curve log r at r equal to 1. And more importantly, it's always about the curve log r. This means that if we set lambda as 1, we ensure our estimator remains non-negative and achieves lower variance. Let's try it. Yes, this estimator gives us an unbiased estimate of the true Carroll divergence while having a lower variance. How cool is that? Hopefully this video provides an intuitive understanding of what Carroll divergence is and a practical trick of estimating it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.